But it's good to be here, and we're going to have a little bit of a different kind of service today, so you'll find out more about that soon. But uh, i got a few things to let you know about what's going on with Lincoln Road Chapel. Uh, the first thing I want you guys to be aware of is that we have a uh, book study coming up. This is a new initiative that we have started um, called uh, On the Same Page Book Study. We get together, we share a meal, we have a conversation around a book. So for this one, um, the first time we are going to be meeting is January 22nd, which is a Sunday. Um, we're going to be reading uh, a church called Tove. If you don't know what it is, it's about a goodness culture. It's about how do we become a good, healthy culture of church. So I'm hoping that we're going to have really, really good conversations leading out of this. If you're interested at all in this, you can register online um, or come talk to me afterwards and we'll find a time to set you up. Uh, you have the option to purchase the book. We also have a few books that you can borrow from our library that we'll get you set up with. So if that's a barrier to entry, we'd love to still have you come and be part of that conversation. And then the second thing is the week after, um, we're doing a parenting conference. We're bringing in uh, one of my friends who I used to work with at my last church named Natalie Frisk. She um, creates curriculum for kids, and she has a book called Raising Disciples, which is a book about how do we um, parent our children, how do we help them understand the gospel, how do we raise them to value faith in Jesus. Um, so that's actually going to be Saturday, January 28th. I'm going to fire my marketing person. It was me. Um, it says January. Oh, did you change it? I'm going to hire Andrew as my marketing person because he changed it. Thank you for doing that. And there was some confusion because I had the 29th up there. It now says the 28th. Apparently, I can't read. So anyway, Saturday, January 28th, we are going to be here in the building. There is child care available, um, but you're going to have to register for that online. Natalie is a fantastic, I've, I've worked with her before, and she um, now works for a global company that makes curriculum for kids. So it, her voice in this would be fantastic for you to come, and also just to come and meet other parents and talk uh, with other people who are on the same journey as you. Whether you are uh, a parent of a newborn, or a parent-to-be, or you are uh, a parent of a toddler, or a kid, or junior high, or senior high, if your kid's over 25, might not be as practical, but you can still come, because we'd still love to have you, and you can share wisdom with others around there. So I don't want to say you can't come, but it would be great to have all these parents together um, to just kind of celebrate that and be the community that we can be. Uh, let me pray for us, and then we'll uh, launch into some worship. God, we want to thank you uh, for a new year. Thank you for new beginnings. Thank you for uh, new ways for you to meet with us and encounter with us over this year. We pray in anticipation of all the ways that you are going to be working within our community, both as LRC and as Waterloo, Father. I pray that you will be with us today uh, as we dive uh, into your word, as we dive into drawing closer to you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Good morning, uh, church. Um, yeah. Uh, I want to yeah welcome you guys as we get back into this new year. Um, that yeah maybe for some of you guys it's just a season of transitions. Maybe there's some gains. Maybe there's some losses. Um, but I just want to yeah remind that we worship a God who's with us every step of the way. Um, he's our continual living hope, and that He brings us actually together here and both online to be able to heal and encourage each other. So if you guys will rise and join me in musical worship this morning. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I found in the desert place, where I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. 
Blessed be your name And the sun shining down on me And the world's all as it should be Blessed be your name Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering There's pain in the offering Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. to sing, Lord, blessed be your name, you give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to sing, Lord, blessed be your name, so be the name of the Lord, blessed be Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious When all that's within me feels dry This is my prayer and my hunger and need My God is the God who provides This is my prayer in the fire In weakness or trial or pain There is a faith I'm more worth than gold So refine me, Lord, through the flame I will bring praise I will bring praise No weapon forms against me shall remain I will rejoice I will declare God is my victory and He is This is my prayer in the battle When triumph is still on its way I am a conqueror and co with Christ So firm on His promise I stand I will bring praise, I will bring praise No weapon forms against me shall be God is my victory and He is here. 
to sing I have a reason to worship Cause I will bring praise I will bring praise No weapon forms against me shall remain I will rejoice I will declare God is my victory and He is here This is my prayer in the harvest When favor and providence flow I know my field to be emptied again The seed I received I will sow Amen. So as we head into... Yeah, just preparing ourselves to hear, hear from Debbie and we'll be reminded just how good of a father we have um, in Jesus. So. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like but I've heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night And you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone You're a good, good father to you all, to you all to you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am it's who I am I've seen many searching for answers far Searching for answers only you provide Cause you know just what we need before we say a word You're a good, good father It's who you are, it's who you are It's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Cause you're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to Who you are, who you are, and I'm alive. 
Dismissed to your class. Guys, take a seat. Hey. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you. Just pull this up a little bit. Oh, maybe not. Good morning. It's great to see you and great to see you guys online. My name is Debbie Lejinsky, and I'm looking forward to sharing this space with you, um, hearing God uh, from each other, from his word. And um, just a, a little practical thing. I did put some, we're going to have a couple of reflection times today. So if you're a person who likes to take notes or follow along, there's just a little handout over where the communion table is, and you're welcome uh, to get those. Before we start, I'm just going to pray for us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you that we can gather in your name and gather around Jesus, our Lord. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you will open our hearts and bring us softness. And that we will be able to receive from you what you want to give us today. In Christ's name, amen. So I've I've entitled this, um, you know, uh, singing songs, singing new songs in a foreign land. And, uh, and then the kind of the sub thing is post-pandemic. And I just want to clarify that. Somebody helped me with that this week. I'm not saying the virus is gone by any means, but what I mean by that is we've come out of the lockdowns, the isolation, and the higher level of an unknowing that we walked through. So I want to invite you to read our main scripture with me today. It's taken out of Psalm 137. Can't see it back there. Okay, say it with me. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There, on the poplars, we hung our harps. For there, our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing God's songs while in a foreign land? Thank you. I've had it on my heart for a while that it's been hard for people to know what to do with these last years in the pandemic. How to process the losses, how to acknowledge the gains, and make some space for healing, because we really do need healing. There isn't one of us in the whole world that hasn't suffered in some way. And God doesn't measure small or big. He doesn't compare our sufferings to each other. He sees each one of you. He sees me and he cares. And then how do we go forward? We find ourselves in a very strange world, a foreign, a type of foreign land. And a lot of things happened in these last years that we were trying to manage isolation and homeschooling children and working from home and losing loved ones, unable to function the way we previously had. And I'm not going to go into all the ways that the world's changed, but I do want to note that this is not the world that we previously knew. Would you agree with me? Feel free to shout out, that's right, or whatever you want to say. (laughs) Yeah. I am, I'm struck by a time in history when God's people uh, went through something that has a lot of parallels for us, actually. And it was a time when Babylon came to Jerusalem, destroyed their temple, and took God's people away into captivity, into a foreign land, into Babylon. They felt misplaced. Their grief was raw. And they wondered how they were going to sing their songs in this foreign land. In other words, 
How would they live in the joy of their God in this foreign place that was nothing like they knew, where there was no temple, no center of worship, no stability to undergird their faith? So we're going to engage with this story today that's been given to us and ask the Holy Spirit to help us see ourselves and see God and hear God's word to us today in it. And I just want to mention that after this message, um, next Sunday and the Sunday after are going to be um, healing workshops here where we can engage with this message more interactively. It's from 12.30 to 2. You have to bring a bag lunch. And it's open to everyone, not just people that attend LRC. And um, if you're not able to do the in-person, there is an online option on Saturday, this coming Saturday, from 10 until 1. And so you can just, you can just let me know uh, which one you would prefer so I can get you the material and maybe the Zoom link or whatever you need. We don't know who wrote Psalm 137, but whoever he was, he had experienced the exile in Babylon. This may have been written shortly after the captivity ended, or possibly as it had just gotten started, but it's the historical setting and context for this psalm. Some of the backstory, you know, how did, how did they get here? How did they end up in exile. King David, who wrote a lot of the Psalms, said to be a man after God's own heart, had defeated Israel's most threatening enemies and had organized plans for building the temple, God's temple in Jerusalem, the center of true worship. In the end, it was his son Solomon who oversaw the building of this temple. And it was dedicated to God in a grand opening. And um, God showed his presence to the people that day. It was very exciting. Then things started to unravel. Because Solomon married foreign wives. And they brought their false gods, their idols with them. And he gave them free reign to worship their false gods. And eventually... Uh, false worship began to permeate Israel. This ultimately led to a civil war after Solomon's death. The nation was divided into two, Judah in the south with Jerusalem as its capital city and where the temple was, and then Israel in the north. And Solomon's son Rehoboam ruled Judah, Jerusalem, and uh, Rehoboam, who had been a servant of Solomon, he ruled in the north. Now, although King Jeroboam wanted to bring the people back to God, remember, he's the guy in the north, he didn't want them going over to the other side. He didn't want them going over to Jerusalem to worship at the real temple. So he thought of a plan, and he made two gold calves to honor, in honor of God, and I'm sure God loved that. Um, and then he started to put, uh, you know, worship up on the hills, the pagan hills where they had had their idol worship, and he appointed priests that weren't Levites, which was a, pr a pretty big no-no. And so from then on, Israel was characterized by mixing true worship with false worship. And because the people did not keep God's commandment to worship him alone, God allowed the northern kingdom to be defeated by Assyria in a series of invasions until finally in 722, Assyria completely defeated them and took them captive. The southern kingdom didn't do much better. As their idolatry increased, God raised up the nation of Babylon to invade them. And finally, in 586, the city of Jerusalem, along with the temple, was destroyed. And in a series of deportations, um, the people were taken captive to Babylon. God's people were no longer in their land, no longer in their holy city. They no longer had their temple. They were in exile. 
They had been a unique people with specific spiritual identity, and now they were aliens and strangers. When the Israelites were in their own land, the culture of their worship and everything else, all the rest of the culture, it was all one. So now they find themselves in this place where the culture is completely hostile to their beliefs, to their worship. And this is the setting for Psalm 137. The psalmist gives voice for this communal lament. A lament is a prayer that just says it as it is what's really going on, not where we wish we could be, not where we think we should be, but where we actually are. But the difference between lamenting and just complaining is there's always an element of trust and praise to God expressed in this unedited prayer. So we're going to add two more verses to the verses we read in the beginning. And I want you to to listen for what stands out to you. You don't need to know why right away, but just listen for what stands out to you. I'm going to turn around, but read it with me, okay? By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we thought of Zion, our home so far away. On the branches of the willow trees, we hung our hearts and hid our hearts from the enemy. And the men that surrounded us made demands that we clap our hands and sing songs of joy from days gone by, songs from Zion, our home. Such cruel men taunted us, haunted our memories. How could we sing a song about the eternal in a land so foreign while still tormented, broken-hearted, homesick? Please don't make us sing this song. O oh, Jerusalem, even still, don't escape my memory. I treasure you and your songs, even as I hide my harp from the enemy. And if I can't remember, may I never sing a song again. May my hands never play well again. For what use would it be if I don't remember Jerusalem as my source of joy? giving you a moment to think about what stands out to you in all of that. A word, a phrase, an image. And then once you get that, what emotion does it evoke in you? What would be the top emotion that you would feel as you have read these things and as you find that nugget that stands out to you. Some of these maps are going. Tuck it away, keep it as we go through this time together. They sat and wept by the rivers of Babylon, thinking about their home so far away. If you've ever been homesick, who's who's ever been homesick? Yeah, just think about that. You know, that's just a little part of what they would have been feeling. And there's nothing like losing something to realize what we had and long for it back. You know, the Hebrew people were not uncomfortable with grief the way we can tend to be in the West. They they weren't afraid of of expressing their grief that it would overtake them. Like, I think we think, oh boy, if I I give space to, like, sadness, anger, whatever, that's just going to be a big, dark hole. It's going to suck me down. I'm I'm never going to get out. But that's not really what happens. Because when we give space to that, it tells us what's going on. And when we are with Jesus in that, it loosens its grip and we can hear him and we can experience being with him right in the middle of things. If we don't mourn, we will not know where we need comfort and we will not acknowledge the healing that we need. 
and we do need healing. The reality is that uh, a lot of our struggles in the pandemic began before the pandemic. Like the Hebrew people with their mix of worship before their exile. And if we're honest, we can look back and see where maybe we had grown a bit apathetic or maybe not as aware of our need for God. This happens. It's not a condemning thing. It's part of our human condition, part of our lives. And we thank God that he understands this and draws us back in different ways. And there was something else that was happening before the pandemic. There was this spiritual restlessness a deeper desire for authenticity and for a lot of people a soul weariness just a weariness and i'm not saying that god sent the pandemic i'm not saying that at all but he certainly used it to make us aware of our lives right when you agree yeah like maybe some of our lives were overly full uh, maybe we started to realize we weren't able to engage with God the way we once did. Maybe we were becoming aware of things that we were doing that we really didn't want to do. That maybe we need more space for relationships, family. This is where a lot of us were when we hit exile. Exile. Exile the state of being barred from one's native country, typically for political or punitive reasons. But the part that I want to focus on in that definition is being barred. We were barred, if you remember, from family and friends. We were barred from stores, and people couldn't run their businesses, couldn't go to work, lost their jobs, couldn't gather as faith communities, and we could go on, right? This impacts our psyches. It's a long time. It wasn't a short time. Months before the pandemic, when I was on staff here as a, as a pastor, I found myself saying things to God that I didn't really understand. I don't know if that ever happens to you. But my office was in the back 40, and when I would walk from the main office back there, I would say to God, you know, I feel like my plane is coming in for a landing. I, I don't know how, I don't know when, but I, I can feel it. And then I would say, this was even stranger, I would say, you know, I just want to go home. Well, wasn't that a prophetic, we all went home, right? <laughs> Yeah, so it was very strange for me, but I remember the day that we met um, in room 101 to decide whether to close the church. That not weird even to hear me say that? Decide whether we would close the church or not? And we were sharing thoughts and back and forth, and then this message came in on uh, Andrew's watch that the schools were closed. And then we knew, we knew the answer. And I remember all of us putting things in order and um, putting signs on the door that said closed until further notice. It was surreal, right? And I went around to the different places that are close to my heart here, you know, the prayer room, the community room, the storehouse. And I wondered if I would return I just had a, a sense of the ending of something. So as staff, we all gathered together to figure out how to gather us and put us online to pray and for messages. And thank you, Andrew. You would have been sunk <laughs> if you wouldn't have been uh, helping with that so, so much. And then when we got all that settled, you know what? I went, I went home. And I sat down by my own river and I cried quite a bit. And I'm sure you have too, in your own way. Yeah, it's been quite the journey. Processing things with God, 
slow healing. That's the best kind because it goes deep, just want to say. Restoration. Finding my way to a new song with God, a new season. That's just a little personal, just, you know, we all have a personal story out of this time. And every story is important. And then we have a communal story. We have a communal, a communal grief. So much of what felt like home, where the heart lies down, that just seemed gone forever. And we can't just leap over that. That's what I want to say. We can't just leap over that. We have to honor it and allow it a voice. So I'm going to invite you to take some time to think about what your losses were in the hardest part of the pandemic. Now, for some of us, that's easy. For some of us, that is just terrifying. What? I am not going to sit here. and um, We're not going to stay there. We're just going to be there for a few minutes. But there is an alternative. While we are pondering this before God, in the presence of God, we are going to play um, a communal lament of Psalm 137. And if you would prefer to just sit and listen to the song and be ministered to, there's that option too. So we will begin that and we will uh, give you time to do that. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept When we thought of home so far away On the branches of the willow trees we hung our harps And hid our hearts from the enemy And the men that surrounded us made demands That we clap our hands and sing
Lord, we just open our hearts. Thank you for this lament. Thank you for space. Comfort our hearts, Holy Spirit, as we continue on today. Amen. So they hung their harps in the willow trees, and they hid their hearts from the enemy. The psalmist describes it so well. To remember when we didn't even know what we could say, we were hiding our hearts in many ways because it was so divisive. You know, families were being busted up because people thought differently on, on different sides. And well, it still, still seems like the whole world is angry. You know? So there was that, that element. You know? and, and then we try to tell ourselves to just go on. I don't know, does that, does that work for you very well? That never really works long term for me. To sing the songs that we once sang, and we felt we couldn't. We just couldn't. Like the displaced people in Babylon, all our grounding parts seemed gone. And that's what it means to hang our harps of our former lives of worship on branches of a willow tree. It was customary for the Jews to gather for worship by a river because they engaged in religious ceremonial washings. And it's very likely that the setting to this psalm by the waters of Babylon refers to their attempt to worship in exile. And we too have to learn how to worship in this exile, right? We had to, we still have to. And the willow tree is a symbol of fertility and new life. That's encouraging. A willow branch can be planted in the ground, and from it, a new tree will grow. And willow, the English word willow, it means freedom. So even though God's people hung their harps in the willow trees, they hoped for a new day. They hoped that this time in exile would lead them back to God in new ways. They hoped to return to their temple and rebuild. We today can return to the temple once again. God has made us his temple. This building is not the temple. This building is a place where we gather to be the temple together. So could it be that part of our healing is cleansing? Jesus promises that rivers of living water will flow through our bellies. The pandemic has gifted us to see where maybe some of the blockages to this river are. What purging happened in you, in your life, in the pandemic? What awareness of the state of your soul rose up when it had space? How did the stopping help? Remember, it was a stop, it was a big stop sign. How did that help? So now I'd like you to just take a little bit of time and think about what did I gain from the pandemic? What did I gain? How did God what gifts did he bring me during that time? If you do better um, visually, you can engage with this picture and just see what you notice in it and what God is speaking to you about his gifts or whatever. If you had a word or a phrase, short phrase, or an image, does anybody want to share what their gifts would be? We just, you can just holler it out and I'll repeat it for you. 
Peace and solitude in being alone. Thank you. Intentionality in relationships. Thanks. Somebody. Resting on the rock. Thank you, Fred. Patience. More time for your kids. New perspectives. Thank you. A break from the busy, yes, yeah. The psalmist expressed the longings of the people's souls. He says, oh Jerusalem, even still, don't escape my memory. I treasure you and your songs even as I hide my heart from the enemy. And if I can't remember, may I never sing a song again. May my hands never play well again. For what use would it be if I don't remember Jerusalem as my source of joy? And for them, Jerusalem and God were all together. So we could actually say, O Lord, cause us to remember you. Help us 